How do you write good dialogue? I think the best dialogue comes from the best listeners. Um, I had a, an absolute crash course in writing dialogue. Years ago, I, I used to write with Charlie Sheen. Um, I don't care if they don't credit him in the sitcoms he's been in as a writer. I know who's been writing the dialogue. I worked with him for three years. I, I never read or heard better dialogue from anybody than that came from him that he wrote. Um, and I asked him one day, uh, I used to be really good at writing scene direction. My dialogue was flat. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't engaging. It wasn't edge of your seat. And I asked him one day when we were writing, um, the way we worked is we'd set it up and I would write the scene direction and he would do the dialogue unless, you know, it was some basic stuff. It was easy. And I finally said to him, I said, where do you get this encyclopedia of incredible dialogue? I, I've never heard anybody with it before. And he said, you just listen. He said, you know, when this was working, these aren't working. And if these aren't working, you can't absorb what's happening and how people interact and find those gems. He said, most, most of the things that I write that people like, I heard at a party, I heard at a barbecue, I heard at an airport, I heard while I was pumping gas. He said, you know, I'll get out and pump gas and I'll hear a couple bickering in the car next to me at the pump. And he said, that's gold. He goes, that is gold, man. He said, you know, and this is before everybody had phones. So we, were, we weren't listening to them. We were doing this. So I find the best, the best advice to writing a dialogue is listen. Put yourself in a character's position that you've created. You know, it goes back to the old, um, I think, keeping an audience interested in good dialogue. I think also the problem is a lot of people try to outwit themselves with dialogue. They, they think they got to use verbiage or words that people don't use. They, they got to show you how smart they are. I think we've talked about it before. It's like the drummer that overplays everything to show, look how good my chops are. And it's not about that. It's, it's, about, it's about making things sound organic. And that's a lot of things that the actors have to understand too is you know, they're acting or are they truly listening and responding with the work. Um, but I think the best dialogue comes from the best listeners and the people that know how to implement those words that they've discovered over the years in new, in new arenas. I mean, obviously you're not gonna be pumping gas at a gas station and hear a husband and wife, every script you write is not gonna be about a husband and wife pumping gas at a gas station. So where else can you implement that? Could that be a film like Sahara where Matthew McConaughey and Pen Penelope Cruz are walking across the desert or you can put some of that bickering in in different situations, but it's, it's how you use it, and how it inspires you to go down different paths. Um, that's how I've, I, I learned from him to, to write better dialogue. I'm still not very good, but I know, I, I know good dialogue when I hear it and I'm good at adjusting dialogue when I get it. And I, I, it's about listening. And now people are on phones, so you can just hear one side you of You only dialogue. hear one side. And I don't think people realize or they care how well you can hear them and how dialed in everybody, no pun intended, to the people are to what, I mean, I've heard some major arguments, major personal, th and I'm like, I don't think this person realizes I can hear them halfway across the store, but that's gold too. It's gold and it's even better when they're when they're on speakerphone, so you do get to hear all of it or their the receiver's up so loud, but you're right. I mean, sometimes you'll hear one half of the conversation and sometimes that can be better because you're able to imagine, I mean, can you imagine if it was, hey, Harold, you didn't take the trash barrels in and that's what the whole fight's about, but you're only hearing Harold's side. Can you imagine what you can create Maude is yelling to him about? I mean, When you were working uh, at the car lot, mm. did, it, did you pick up anything about dialogue? I realize that's not why you were there. But if I'm coming to look at a car, you know, I'm probably going to be hesitant. I'm probably going to be like, I don't want this guy to sell me anything, but I do need a car, but I don't want to let him know that. Sure, sure. So I'm going to be very selective with what I say. Um, I learned, um, as I said, when the owner of, of Galpin had said, come sell cars, he said, you'll learn more about life than you've ever known, and it'll be the education that you lacked. He wasn't, he wasn't kidding. Um, you become a good listener because you have to overcome all objectives. You have to address every concern and need that a customer has. So how does that happen? It happens by listening. And I always, I, it wasn't dialogue lines. I don't think, in, and I have a very retentive memory. If I hear something, I remember it. Um, there wasn't anything said in those 18 months I worked there that stood out, but it was mannerisms, it was quirks, it was character flaws or, or neat 
things about people that I that I still to this day will implement in my characters. Um, the way a husband and wife interact. It's not about what's said, it's about how it's said. It's about the posture. It's about um, the the 45-year-old son who's with the 70-year-old parents buying the Ford Taurus today, and you realize the parents have a gambling addiction, they're getting a car to drive to Vegas every other week, but the 45-year-old son still lives at home to help supplement the the overhead so they can afford to maintain their lifestyle, and the kid's kind of a deadbeat too. I mean, there's all sorts of, and then you look at that and you go, wow, that's that's a story. You know, you got this retired this retired milkman and his wife who ran a salon and now they are addicted to going to Vegas every, well, what else are they doing when they go to Vegas that we don't know about, you know? And then your minds are, what do they see on that trip to Vegas? Um, you know, it's the the lotto winners. I sold, I sold to a few lotto winners. That was interesting. I actually had a salesman I worked with who had won $24 million in the big lotto and he left his wife and Two and a half years later, he was at the point selling cars with me. And you want to talk about like having it all and losing it. And you know, friends who abandoned him when the money was gone. And he said, Yeah, you know, it's funny, my wife still has her 10 million. You know, and here I am selling cars, trying to make, trying to make a living, living in a one-bedroom apartment, you know. And he was the one who left her and was horrible to her. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you see a whole bunch of really interesting people. Um, but that two years, sorry to interrupt, no. but that two years was probably very fascinating. It was fascinating. Uh, as I said, I'm still very close to the family that, that gifted me that opportunity, the Bachmans. I am still very close to some of the salesmen that I worked with a lot. You know, sadly, some of them have perished. Um, you know, some of the people that were in that sales class I took, Patrick Wellman just died six months ago, I found out. And Stuart Sank, who sold with me, and I got the most character stories out of them. Anybody in the world passed. Uh, these were people I worked with and I, I was very close to. And um, it was amazing, uh, just the people, the experiences, the, the encounters of just walking out having a cigarette and encountering a guy whose car is in for an oil change and that 20 minute exchange you have with this guy. Those conversations will live with you forever, but you don't have to sell cars to do it. You can, you can drive an Uber, you can work at a restaurant as a waiter, you can work anywhere. Most of the encounters that I've had in my life that I write about are about personal experiences or exchanges or encounters that I've had anywhere. But it's funny you bring up the car years because that was my job five, six days a week. I'd spent those eight to 12 hours a day at the dealership dealing with no two days were ever the same. Fighting between you know salesmen for a customer or a customer, you know, there's an old saying in buying cars, it's all buyers or liars. And it was about trying to, I learned something. Um, we used to have a salesman there that sold ungodly amounts of cars and made ungodly amounts of money. And I used to say to him, what's your secret? And he says, you just got to remember all buyers are liars. And they're telling you one thing because they think they can have an edge. And the secret to successfully selling cars is giving buyers, they got to trust you, they got to like you and want to deal with you. But he said, you have to let them think they have control, but they really don't have an ounce of it. And it's almost like being a film director. Actors love to be directed and controlled, but they also like to think that they, they're the show. They're the, and as a, a good director will help steer them and let them think that they can run with it. And you gotta be able to rein them in without them knowing you're being reined in. It's, it's an art, it's a dance. And it's that way selling cars. Um, but it taught me how to negotiate. Um, selling cars and negotiating four, five, six times a day sure taught me how to go out and raise money. Sure taught me how to negotiate with contracts and actors and agents. It's the same thing. How much for how much, right? So that's a st everybody should go sell cars and you'll become a better filmmaker. <laughs>